Uh, Gautam Chachoria from UBS now joins us. Gautam, good morning. Uh, you know, what do you make of the run that we are seeing in the market? Uh, you know, it just tells you that it's a bull market and just refuses to fall on any news? Good morning. Uh, it's just largely driven by what's happening globally. So it's a global liquidity surge. Obviously, local flows also are helping. Uh, but we have to remember that, that this is happening uh, broadly globally also in most markets uh, and definitely in emerging markets. And just to buttress the point, uh, India is not necessarily the best performing emerging market this year, uh, despite India having done, done reasonably well. So this is, this is largely a reflection of what's happening globally. Uh, the domestic factors we all sitting here focus on a lot, uh, which is also a positive. Uh, but this is largely being driven by what, what's happening to the global liquidity and risk appetite. Uh, in that context, uh, our view is uh, still that uh, the risk reward at these levels are definitely not attractive fundamentally. Uh, having said that, uh, if the global liquidity surge continues and we see lower interest rate environment globally, specifically negative rates, uh, that can that can take take markets further up. You, you can't rule that out. But fundamentally, uh, the risk reward is definitely unattractive at these levels. Right. Uh, so, you know, as you said that, uh, you know, fundamentally risk rewards are not attractive, but liquidity can continue. So, tactically, India is a positive market, but, you know, you would trade with a caution that that should be the ideal uh, ideal strategy? Yeah, I, I would definitely advise caution here. Uh, tactically, short term, anything can happen, but uh, no, no one can analyze or predict, predict the short term moves. Uh, and I won't uh, just recommend investors uh, to play momentum uh, for, for a week or for a month. Uh, but you have to keep the fundamentals in mind and we have, over the longer term we've always seen that if you don't buy the markets and sector at the right valuation levels uh, you may end up uh, uh, not making money or even losing money so uh, you ha you cannot ignore the fundamentals and that definitely is not very supportive at these levels right uh, you know uh, how would you look at uh, you know the range you always have a range as far as nifty is concerned so are we currently at the higher end of the range and looking at the earnings that we've got so far there is no reason to change that uh, range? Definitely. So uh, our base case uh, for Nifty would be 7,700. Uh, that's based on our top-down estimates of earnings growth, which is much lower than what the street is building in. Uh, if we presume that the recovery is stronger than what we are building in, in terms of earnings, uh, and closer to what the street is expecting, uh, then, then, and markets trade at uh, near all-time high multiples, then the fair value of the market would be 8,600 Nifty. Uh, and clearly the markets are at that level. So risk reward is definitely uh, unattractive because it's pricing in a strong recovery and at a higher, uh, higher end of the multiple uh, at these levels. Right. Uh, as far as uh, earnings are concerned so far, uh, Q1, of course, is, uh, you know, not not a reason to upgrade the numbers probably as you go towards q2 you get six months numbers or towards q3 you would look at significant change for fi 17 but as of now the numbers that we are getting there seems to be more misses uh, than hits at least in the large cap space uh, yes and no uh, so e even uh, la last few quarters we have seen us kind of a mix of both beats and misses but in aggregate yes uh, th this this is puts to rest the uh, the hopes being raised after the 4Q numbers uh, that the growth recovery in earnings is back. So 1Q kind of puts rest to that uh, that uh, uh, hope, definitely. And that's where we are coming in from, from our top-down view. To top-down, we do expect earnings cuts to happen for FY17. For example, the street is looking at 17% earnings growth for FY17, uh, while our top-down framework suggests a 10% earnings growth for FY17. So we will see that earnings cuts happen. Uh, and in that, in that context, 1Q numbers looks likely to be a low single digit uh, growth rate for, for Nifty, uh, which implies the ask for second half this year is going to be very, very high and uh, unrealistic in our view. Right, but a lot of people have said that the base effect will particularly, you know, take that number on a growth space to be very high. Uh, do you agree with that view or it's, it's largely known and, you know, when we're talking about growth numbers, it will, you know, still go ahead and look at all tasks. So 10%, when, it, when you say top-down 10% growth, that, that, that factors in the low base effect for, for last year. And base effect has been low for the last three, four years. Uh, so nothing new per se. So what we would look at is an accelerating economic growth, uh, not a steady state economic growth for earnings to come back up. Uh, and and uh, if you look at the hopes for the second half recovery, uh, which is premised on a good monsoon, on pay commission boost, in our view, these are all marginal positives. They are not material as far as the macro or earnings cycle is concerned. They will help definitely, but only marginally. And that's kind of baked into our 10% expectation. 
uh, for for if markets are expecting pay commission and, and monsoons to provide a big boost, uh, I think markets will be uh, will will be disappointed. Right. Uh, you know, as far as uh, you know, the earnings mix is concerned. So till now, we had you know names like Lupin, Doctor Reddy's, or the Pharma Pack doing well, IT doing very well. Now we are seeing a very big shift from that that space. That you know what was performing is not performing, so and IT, you know what is. Yeah. Uh, go so ahead. That's also because because uh, yeah, a lot of hopes is around the domestic uh, economic recovery, and that's why you've seen uh, some shift away from IT and pharma over the last few quarters, and specifically also because uh, pharma pharma sector had concerns around FDA, I, I, IT services cut guidance. In that context, our, our view top down is that we like pharma, we are overweight pharma because in our view, the concerns on FD, etc. are backward looking uh, and valuations are now attractive. Uh, while IT services, we've had a fundamentally negative view since a year and a half about the disruption caused by a move to digital, uh, and which is what is already showing up in terms of cuts in guidance, etc. So we still stick to that view. Uh, while the stocks have come off, uh, may look attractive versus historical levels, but well, this is a multi-year uh, de-rating uh, story in our view, and we'll still avoid uh, avoid the sector. So still maintaining an underweight stance on IT services. Right. You know, I was not talking particularly about IT or pharma, but I'm just saying that compositions of earning is changing. So you know, some of the sectors that were performing will now stop performing in terms of numbers, or their growth rate would be lower than the market earnings growth rate. Is that a possibility? And high beta, or you know, beta may actually start to perform. It could happen. Uh, you can't rule that out. Uh, but again, uh, you can't take just a simplistic approach like that. Uh, it has to be more sector fundamental or company fundamental based. Right. Uh, as far as the mid cap space is concerned, you look at it very closely. Mid cap numbers justify the valuations that we have seen or the run up in the valuations that we have seen in the last 18 months? Uh, clearly no. Uh, so the fundamental wise, uh, they are definitely stretched. Uh, they are reflecting the fact that local uh, inflows into markets have been very strong over the last few months. Uh, and that's what's helped the mid caps uh, 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 trade at very, very high valuation. Now, theoretically, there is an argument that uh, in a recovering economy, mid caps have higher operating and financial leverage and they, they, they can deliver higher earnings growth. Uh, so that, 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 that's the theoretical part, but we don't see that necessarily the case in a broad mid-cap based uh, sector. Uh, obviously, few sectors and stocks within that can deliver that, uh, but the multiples, even if you assume that, uh, seem very, very stretched to us. Right. Uh, so right now, you would advise to shift from mid-cap to large-cap space. Uh, you know, that, that, that can be a trade that one can look at. Definitely, definitely, uh, because the overall market risk reward is unattractive. Uh, mid caps are trading at much more stretched valuation. So, uh, from from a near term perspective, that that would make sense. Right. So, you know, one part is of course about the near term valuations, which is uh, you know slightly uh, higher as far as the overall markets are concerned. But you know, the big change, of course, which even you pointed out, has been the negative interest rate yields. Or you know, this this world has changed in terms of the way it was operating for the financial space. Do you think PEs would get re-rated for really long? Frankly, no, no one has an answer because uh, negative interest rates uh, is a new phenomena for macro and economic experts globally. Uh, it's not something which, which uh, the world has seen. Uh, so theoretically, uh, that's one of the arguments that uh, lower, lower interest rates or negative interest rates can drive P multiples higher, which is what's happening right now. But if negative interest rates start hurting the macro stability or, 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 or growth prospect in some parts, then how does it impact uh, uh, growth rates and equities? It's tough to say. Uh, so it will still, still, be naive to just look at uh, one element of the equation where you argue that lower interest rates will drive up P multiples, which is what's happening right now, definitely. But is it a sustainable phenomena is, is debatable at this stage. So I, I don't have a clear, strong view yet on that. Right, but uh, do you think that that is something which uh, one should focus on, or uh, you know, do you believe that when this liquidity starts to go, or you know, what are the triggers that you would look at for this liquidity to start to reduce? So it's obviously so when you say have lower or negative interest rates, and it does not help in driving growth up, uh, while it 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 has its own negative macro implications. It's a tax on the financial services system, for example. Uh, 
wherever you have negative interest rates. So if it starts showing up in some negative impacts because of that, uh, then, then it could hurt sentiment and flows and risk appetite. Uh, but how and when is tough, tough to say. Right. Uh, very difficult to take a call on that space, so better to be caution. I would advise so, because I, I want you to never ignore uh, fundamentals in terms of uh, the growth outlook and, and absolute valuations. Uh, so the, these, at these valuation levels, uh, the risk reward is definitely unattractive. Right. Uh, you know, as far as U.S. Fed rates are concerned, or when do we see Fed rate hiking, uh, that could be a big uh, signal to the market that, uh, you know, the free money in the world is ending. If they do go ahead, yes. Uh, our house view is that uh, they hike rates in December, not before that, uh, this year. Uh, so, but if they if the surprise uh, in the, in September, then obviously that would be a near-term negative for market sentiment. Right. But what's your view with the, the situation that we are in, or what's the UBS uh, you know house view in terms of uh, U.S. Fed rates? So our house view is that they hike rates only in December. That's the first first time they hike rates, not in September. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, as far as GST is concerned, that's been a big surprise for the markets. Uh, or rather, you know, it was expected to go through, but that now that it has gone through, uh, do you believe that will add to earnings or it's, it's you know, still far away and, you know, one should just wait before they factor it in, in, into earnings? So one, uh, in, the, in the near term, when, whenever it gets implemented, in the first year, it's likely to be disruptive. And in fact, it could provide a a potentially a negative surprise in the short term in terms of earnings. But over the longer term, uh, at the margin, it will be addictive to earnings because it will drive productivity and uh, higher growth longer term. Having said that, if we try to just do a uh, back of the envelope calculation about what it means for uh, fundamental valuation. So if you look at sectors where unorganized sector is a big part, and uh, we assume that the unorganized sector disappears over the next five to 10 years because of GST, then what is the potential impact on NPV of these uh, listed companies? And uh, if you do the maths, simple maths, it indicates that these sectors and stocks have re-rated a lot more that that, that that NPV increase implies. So to us, fundamentally, uh, the GST upside seems to be priced in at these levels, uh, fundamentally, again. Uh, and uh, while not uh, reflecting or ignoring the potential near-term disruption. Right. Uh, but, you know, initially uh, when it would be a disruption or when, you know, people will be adjusting to GST, uh, do you believe that uh, markets may take it slightly negatively? If it's marginal here and there, may not be. Uh, but if it's a, a material uh, delta, then obviously markets will react. And, and, uh, and, and the risk to that is real. I mean, just to put things in context uh, very simplistically, uh, uh, no one has a real clear handle yet as to what the right revenue neutral rate is. Uh, because it's such a, such a complex system and you're replacing that with a new system altogether. Uh, and suppose hypothetically the, the correct revenue neutral rate is 20% and the government gets it wrong on either side by 2%. So instead of 20% it imposes 18% or it imposes 22%. That would mean 10% higher or lower tax revenues for the government. That's a huge number for fiscal. And that's a huge number if they over collect taxes. It's a huge number for the non-government sector paying taxes, which will dampen consumption, dampen business activity. So that's a kind of uncertainty we are looking at. So our guess is that once they do a R&R, &R, uh, it's very much possible that within three to six months they'll be forced to revise because ideally they won't like to have a scenario where they over collect or under collect in the first year because the productivity benefits of GST in terms of higher tax revenues will happen only over the longer term, not near term. Right. Uh, you know, as far as your overweight sectors are concerned, one of the sectors is non-bank financials or NBFCs. Uh, you know, it has done very well. Do you think lower cost of funding is the main trigger for this rally or this excitement around NBFCs? Or, you know, there is much more that the market has realized? So a couple of things, obviously lower interest rates is, is a big driver. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, despite the uh, environment we've had for the last couple of years, we have seen these NBFCs deliver growth in numbers broadly. Uh, and thirdly, in the context of the broader financial services space, they do stand out uh, more positively. So all these things are helping. Uh, now we're seeing some, some pockets of NBFCs where we are seeing valuations getting stretched. Uh, but broadly, the NBFCs still, still seem uh, attractive to us. 
Right. Uh, and do you think further scope of re-rating or now it will be led by earnings? So say if you're expecting 20% growth rate and if they deliver 25%, you may have a 4-5% delta? Yeah, re-rating looks difficult from these levels. Um, there, there would be one or two stocks where there's still some potential, but yeah, largely re-rating looks difficult. But uh, growth visibility is high and that's what uh, drives comfort for us to be overweight that space. Right. Uh, sir, can you talk about, uh, you know, corporate banks as well? Uh, they are slightly underweight on your portfolio, uh, corporate private sector banks. Uh, is that because you believe that their credit cost will be high and NPAs uh, would be higher? Or, you know, what's the call over there? Because, you know, we are getting mixed views on corporate banks. Some people are saying that they could give fantastic returns over the next three years, and some believe that problems over there would continue. So in our view, uh, while the NPL cycle for the broad uh, Indian banking system might be peaking or will peak in FI17, uh, the private corporate lenders are definitely uh, uh, behind the overall system in, in a broad way. There are individual banks which, which have recognized and acknowledged NPL problems much more. Uh, but they're definitely slightly behind, behind the curve. And therefore, we do still expect uh, negative surprises in some uh, corporate private lenders. Uh, and that's the reason why we're still sticking to our uh, under which stance, yeah. Over a three, five year view, uh, you can't really argue that uh, India will not see an economic recovery and these corporate tenders will not come back. But from these levels, what they're pricing in, uh, it's not an obvious buy case for us. Right, and you would just wait and watch for results and management commentary, you know, before we take a, that big call for the next three years? Definitely, and, and also signs of uh, the economic recovery gaining ground because Right now, the economic recovery gaining ground, uh, in our view, is still still a year away, uh, where we see a sharp uptick in recovery. Uh, the hopes around pay commission monsoon, in our view, is uh, is uh, exaggerated. Uh, so unless we see a change in policy stance by government and RBI, uh, we won't see a big economic recovery anytime in the next six to twelve months. Yeah, a year away from now, uh, uh, when the fiscal and monetary impulses neutralize uh, or not be a drag on the macro. Uh, when the banking system is in a much better shape, then we would have a proper, sharper recovery. But uh, definitely not for the next 6 to 12 months. Right. Uh, you know, how would uh, you look at the retail private sector banking space? Can that continue to grow? Uh, the, you know, work that agencies like Sybil and some of the others have done uh, is, it seems to be quite fantastic and NPAs over there are as good as negligible. So retail private banks we continue to like, uh, we still overweight on them and largely also not just because of the credit side but also because of the liability side. So on both sides uh, they continue to deliver uh, for, la for many many years including over the last few quarters. So we still remain comfortable there. Right, uh, you know as far as uh, other of your overweights are concerned, I think the interesting one is oil and gas and petrochemicals. You know, can you just break that down for us, is it the traditional uh, you know, names like ONGC, Reliance, or, you know, you're shifting towards uh, the oil marketing companies which have done very well. So at this stage, uh, we, we prefer the Petchem and, and the upstream guys rather than the downstream guys, given sector performance and valuations. But from a strategy perspective, we are over with the entire sector. Right. Even oil marketing companies? So, uh, from, from our oil and gas analyst perspective, we are underweight the uh, oil marketing companies, uh, uh, given the given the current valuations, etc. Right, but you know, can you just tell us that among the PSU pack, oil marketing is one of the best re-rating story? Potentially possible, uh, but you're taking a big call on oil prices remaining low here. Uh, and it's also call, call, call on uh, valuations are not as cheap as they used to be a year and a half, two years back. Right. Uh, you know, as far as some of your other underweight sectors are concerned, so you spoke about IT, we spoke about private banks, infra and capital goods. You know, that's a space that you are underweight on. Uh, and any, any particular reason? Because, you know, we are getting estimates that GDP will grow fast. It's not possible without capital goods. LNT, which is a reflection of capital good declared good numbers for the last two quarters. Uh, why do we underweight on that sector? So, uh, because we don't see any signs of CapEx uh, cycle recovery happening anytime soon. So, uh, at the broader top-down level, the CapEx cycle is still a year or two years away. Uh, micro, micro part of the CapEx cycle have been doing well for the last two years and will keep doing well. For example, roads. So, anything linked to roads, CapEx, 
uh, should do well, uh, and we would, be, we would be positive on that. But a broader infra capex cycle uh, based uh, approach, uh, we're still underway. We're seeing no signs of pickup yet, uh, including on the power equipment side. Right. Uh, you know, can you just also tell us that, you know, we were talking to a big fund manager and he was of the view the best way to play the CAPEX cycle, you know, uh, would be via the home building companies or infrastructure building companies, companies that supply, you know, small equipments, very niche players into the infra space or the house building space. Uh, would, would you agree to that thought that, you know, that, that should be one of the best ways to play? So in terms of uh, the operating leverage, yes, that, that would make sense. Uh, uh, and we have been positive on home improvement, home building for the last couple of years. Uh, at these levels, cement, we have moved to neutral because, again, the valuations are a bit stretched there for the large caps, definitely. Home improvement, selectively, we do like individual stocks despite the stretched valuations. But yeah, home improvement would be a better, better way to play that. Right. Uh, you know, just a word as far as, uh, uh, you know, the overall... Uh, you know, infra space is concerned. Uh, you know, within the micro sectors, you did mention about roads. Uh, any other sectors that you like, maybe defense, is cement a good way to play infrastructure? I mean, how would you play the infrastructure story apart from roads and home building that we spoke about? So roads, uh, possibly railways, defense uh, lacks any meaningful uh, listed companies, so we don't have a view there. But yeah, defense uh could be interesting but uh, no strong views there but roads and railways are the two mi mi micro sectors where uh, we, we we are positive right uh gotham thank you so much for joining us this morning